We'll go ahead and get started. There are still people entering, but um, we want to be cognizant of time and also be timely. So good afternoon and welcome to the Titan Talks webinar series for Illinois Wesleyan University presented by the Office of Alumni Engagement. I'm Rosetta Clay, Assistant Vice President of Engagement. And once again, we have nearly 200 participants joining us today. And I have to say, when we started this webinar series two months ago, as, as a way to stay connected while we were apart, we believed it could be successful. However, we had no idea how impactful it would be in not only being a medium to stay connected, but also to engage, inform, and educate on a variety of topics. As with all webinars, I'll share a few reminders for how to engage. Please use the chat function to ask your questions, and we will do our very best to answer as many as possible. If you can include your name and grad year, that would be greatly appreciated. If you experience any technical difficulties, try refreshing your browser or leaving the meeting and returning. That usually works. Also, this webinar will be recorded and posted later today for future viewing and sharing. And finally, there will be a number of resources included with the slides for this presentation. Over the past couple of months, we have all heard words like unprecedented and difficult to describe what is happening in the country right now. And in the past two weeks, we've heard phrases like tipping point, and this is a movement. What I will say is I have hope. I hope and believe this truly is the beginning of a new normal, a new normal where we all listen, we empathize, and we try to understand for greater progress. For Illinois Wesleyan, I hope more of us will be willing to do the work necessary to become an equitable campus that strives for a community of belonging. That we're all moving beyond the keyboard, stop pointing fingers, and actually commit to working diligently together to get a better resolve. We didn't get here quickly and progress won't happen quickly. We've got to be able to commit to sustainable change. Last week at the Unity Gathering hosted by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, I was provided the opportunity to give remarks, and I want to share part of what I said with you all today. If you participate in that, in that event, I want to apologize because I do, I won't apologize, I should, should say, because I think repetition is healthy for retention. Some of what I said in speaking about this moment for IWU was that the unfortunate good news is we are here now. The question is, what will we, the global we, trustees, administration, faculty, staff, students, and alumni, what are we going to do to be better? What actions are we going to take? And how will we hold ourselves accountable? Progress, progress is not just for one constituent or stakeholder. We are all part of this community and we should all take responsibility for its existence. Open and honest ongoing dialogue is what we need as a community to be what we hope we should be. We have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It won't be easy, but neither is or has been the current situation for some. I'm excited we're continuing the discussion and even more excited about today's presenter. Dr. Derek Timlin Kelly serves as the director of the UIA Fellows Program and Network Engagement for the University Innovation Alliance. In this role, he works with the UIA leadership to advance the UIA's mission by partnering with member institutions to identify and develop emerging higher education leaders ready to support institutional transformation with the goal of eliminating race, ethnicity, first generation status, and socioeconomic status as predictors of student success and completion and reimagine institutional structures, policies, and processes in support of student success. Dr. Tillman Kelly is a 2009 graduate and serves as Vice President for Engagement of Affinity Groups for the Illinois Wesleyan University Alumni Association Board of Directors. He is a co-principal investigator of the Lewis Stokes Midwest Regional Center of Excellence for Broadening Participation in STEM, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And he is also a trustee of New Salem Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio. 
He earned his PhD in educational policy and leadership with a specialization in higher education and student affairs and a graduate interdisciplinary specialization in sexuality studies from The Ohio State University. He also earned a master's degree in higher education and student affairs from Indiana University. Derek, thank you for immediately saying yes to my request for you to present on this topic. I also want to publicly thank you for your dedication and commitment to Illinois Wesleyan for 15 years, starting as a student and now as an Alumni Association board member. Before you begin though, I'd like to ask if you could start by sharing with everyone the day-to-day -day of your role with UIA and how it relates to today's topic and your pre presentation. Thanks so much, Rosetta. I'm always glad to be with Wesleyan and so really happy for this opportunity. And so as you mentioned, I work for a consortium of pu large public research universities known as the University Innovation Alliance. Um, and my role is twofold. One is to be an ear, um, listening to the needs of our campuses, um, understanding where they're struggling in the support of students, and then helping them connect with one another to imagine new solutions to those problems. But the second and perhaps my favorite don't tell my boss, part of the work um, really is around the development of the UIA fellows. I had the pleasure of being the inaugural fellow um, at The Ohio State University. And in this role, I get to be intentional about ensuring that they understand the higher ed landscape. Um, and so we talk a lot about the current events, the things that are creating pressure for and against higher ed, um, and then ultimately helping us think about how we situate ourselves as professionals um, to engage in the work that higher ed is required to do in this moment. Um, and so realistically, we wrestle with the contemporary issues, but it's hard to have a true understanding of that um, without wrestling also with the past of our institutions. And so we look at the system of higher education, but we also ask fellows to look specifically at their own institution, its founding, who it included or excluded, and then ultimately how that shapes who they are or are not serving extremely well. Great, thank you so much for sharing those details with us. I think it will help in shaping um, our discussion. Um, so one last point to make before Derek begins, his presentation today is meant to provide a historical perspective that we hope will broaden our understanding of how we got to this point in higher education as it relates to race and racism. Derek? Thanks so much, Rosetta. And so I'll take it from here. Um, if you're in the right place at the right time, this is a Titan talk. Um, entitled How We Got Here, Racism and Higher Ed. Um, and anytime that I speak to a group, whether I can see your faces or not, um, it's always helpful to have familiar names in the crowd, um, but also it's important for me to ground myself in this experience. Um, and so I am a proud alum of Illinois Wesleyan University, class of 2009. Um, I am also a black gay man who's a Christian, um, and those things guide the way I show up in this work and in this conversation. And so I just wanna be transparent about those things. And so as we go forward, I'll give you a sense of where we're gonna to go together today. Um, and so for an overview of the presentation, there are gonna be four or five sections really. First, I'm gonna give you a set of key terms and then I'm gonna hone in on a couple of them. Um, I'll give you an introduction to this context and how we're here today. Um, and then I will provide an abbreviated and curated timeline of higher education in the United States. Um, it's really important that you understand that higher ed, for those of us who have degrees in higher education and student affairs, um, the history of the organization and system is a semester long course, um, whether you're in a master's or doctoral program. And so we won't be covering all of that material today, but instead we'll try to talk about how this history relates to the, the history of the country and racism. Um, and then we'll, we'll settle on some application opportunities. How might we apply what we learned today um, to change the behaviors that we have as organizations um, and as, as institutions? And then lastly, we'll have time for Q&A before our continued conversation tomorrow. And so if you were to engage in this conversation, there are lots of words and key terms that might be important. Um, when you think about higher education and particularly issues of race, you will likely have heard affirmative action. Um, you will hear diversity and equity, discrimination, um, inclusion. But there's some other things that you might not hear but are important for framing how we engage in conversation. So there's critical race theory and there's intersectionality that both operate as avenues through which we can view um, systems, organizations, and spaces in which we find ourselves. Um, but for this conversation, I wanna take a bit of time to focus in 
on the concept of racism. Um, many of you know that when we hear racism in society, it's almost always focused on the individual. Um, folks are often called racist um, or said to have had racist behavior. And while individual racism is important and it's about an individual person's beliefs or behaviors, it's really important for us to recognize that that is not the form of racism we will be talking about today. Um, the, the more important for higher education um, understanding of racism is around systemic racism. Um, and systemic racism includes the policies and practices entrenched in established institutions like colleges and universities, which result in the exclusion or promotion um, of designated groups. It differs from overt discrimination in that no individual intent is necessary. Um, and so that becomes really important. And ultimately systemic racism can manifest in one of two ways. One is institutional, and that is that racial discrimination is derived from individuals carrying out dictates or other forms of prejudice um, in a particular setting. And then the more important, I think, for this conversation is around structural racism. And that is the belief that inequalities and inequities are rooted in a system-wide operation um, of society. So that it manifests in things that don't necessarily appear to be individual specific, but if you look at slices of the population, um, some groups, particularly in this instance, racial groups, um, show up in very different ways. And so let's get started. And so as an introduction, I want to share with you a tweet from a Twitter friend, um, meaning we follow each other on Twitter, but I don't know her in real life. Um, and that's Dr. Daria Willis. She's the president of Everett Community College in Everett, Washington. And she posted that higher ed is not immune to perpetuating systemic racism. That is the reason that we're here today. Um, we are not talking about the, the positives or negatives of higher ed specifically. What we're attempting to do though, is to situate our understanding of higher education as a microcosm of the broader society. And so if racism is endemic in, in society, it must by happenstance be endemic in higher education. And so that's why we're here um, and that's how we'll go from here. And so I wanna raise one other point with you all though, so that we're on the same page. Um, when you look at the history of the United States of America, um, it is one that is about opportunity and um, new avenues for individuals to come to understanding who they are and striving for this thing called the American dream. But if you look at the racial dynamics of the US, um, over its history. Um, it has historically been black and white. Um, and so we're going to take a bit of that um, dimension into this conversation. But I recognize, and I hope you recognize as well, that all minoritized racial groups um, experience avenues and forms of racism. The ways it will look will be different, but given our constrained time together, I want it to be intentional about focusing in on a subpopulation, one that I have personal and intellectual experience with, um, and then guide us in that conversation. And so for the next few minutes, I'm gonna walk us through a timeline of the United States higher education system. Um, I will try to embed stories about how this relates to things um, and then engage in that conversation. And so one thing before we jump into the timeline, when I think about President Willis's statement um, that higher ed is not immune to perpetuating systemic racism, I think a lot about my own experience with Illinois Wesleyan University. And the important part is that sometimes the systemic nature of racism in society can color our experiences at institutions. And so if you were to ask me what my most memorable moment at Illinois Wesleyan was, I would tell you that it is not me being elected or uh, hired to be a part of the Student Senate Executive Board as a freshman, it was not the awards that I received from Illinois Wesleyan, and it wasn't even watching my niece graduate from Illinois Wesleyan a year or two ago. Instead, it was an experience that I had with three other black peers um, on our way back to campus in Bloomington Normal. Um, and so we were driving from the skating rink, um, and there were four of us in the car. Um, Crystal was our driver. I won't give last names, but you probably can figure out who it is if you desired. And we were pulled over by the police. And we were a bit perplexed in the car, and so we had a brief conversation before the officer got to the window um, about what was going on. And much to our surprise, the officer let Crystal know um, that he pulled her, her over because she looked lost um, in her drive down High Street. 
or down universe, toward campus. And so we were all a bit perplexed. And so Crystal gave him her driver's license and we gave him our student IDs at Illinois Wesleyan. He was a bit surprised when he recognized that we were students at Illinois Wesleyan, the institution that was just a block away from where we physically were. Um, and so you might say, well, Derek, that, I'm so sorry. That's an experience you had with the police. What does that have to do with systemic racism? And the reality is, the important part is that because we were four black folks in a car, it can be assumed that the officer thought that this place by Illinois Wesleyan likely wasn't for us. And so that, in fact, triggers the way in which we engage in this conversation. But enough about me and my personal story. Let's jump into what the history of higher ed is. And so we're gonna walk a timeline with some stories. You'll notice that there are points on this timeline that I won't personally highlight, but I wanna make sure that you are aware of what was going on and how this shows up. And so to start any conversation about US higher education, we have to go to the year 1636. Um, Harvard College was founded, and that is in fact the first college or university in these United States. Um, it's important to know that Harvard represents one kind of institution of higher ed, but ultimately we all derive from this place with Harvard as we come to understand. And so when Harvard College was founded, it was not an institution meant to educate everyone. And that is the starting place of the US higher education system. Harvard College was in fact structured to educate men, white men, um, white Christian men if we're specific, who wanted to be one of two things, essentially. The first was that they wanted to be a minister. Um, and the second was that they might want to be engaged with growing crops and agriculture, uh, and agriculture engaged in the land. And so that is the foundation of the US higher education system. It was not one meant for everyone, but instead was exclusionary. And so if you think about the US higher education system starting in 1636, you won't find a black person in higher ed until 1799 when John Chavis attended what is now Washington and Lee University. Um, and you might think, well, that's not necessarily a surprise. And you're right, it isn't. Given the context of the US um, and its early form, that isn't a surprise. But it is important to note that some 163 years after the first college or university showed up in the US was the first time you had a black person attend higher ed. Um, and then the second date that I find particularly important when we're talking about this kind of dynamic um, is 1823. Alexander Lucius Twilight um, was the first black graduate from college. He graduated from Middlebe Middlebury College um, and he shows the start of our work in terms of blacks and higher ed and ultimately receiving of the credential that many of us have entered spaces like Illinois Wesleyan. And so from there, we'll keep going. Um, you'll notice Oberlin College is noted at the bottom. It was one of the first institutions founded that always was open to black students and women. Um, and that will come up later for important. And so as we keep going, I'll take us over to 1837. Cheney University was founded for free blacks. Um, so that was only for folks um, who had at that point been freed or not enslaved. Um, but it's important to note that although Cheney University would be the first black specific institution, it was not degree granting until 1932. So even the education space that Cheney University occupied was not really meant to grant a college credential, but instead was more involved in what we would now call the K-12 system. And so those things continue to move forward. Um, and so then let's jump a little forward. In 1850, our very own Illinois Wesleyan University was founded. Um, without this date, we wouldn't be here in this conversation today. You'll notice that Wesleyan is italicized, um, and that's for me to remind myself um, that Illinois Wesleyan University was originally intended to be Illinois University. Um, but with the engagement of Methodist folk, um, we then added the Wesleyan nomenclature to our institution, which allows us to be a part of a very unique history in American higher education. Um, it is also important to know that in 1850, Harvard admitted their first three black students um, but because of pressure from the white student body and their parents, um, Harvard rescinded that admission before the students ever started. So although Harvard was founded in 1636, 1850 was the first time it considered the allowance of black students. And even in that time point, 
um, we did not see success with students being engaged. And so as we keep walking along this timeline, you'll see a couple other things. So in 1855, Berea College was founded in Kentucky. Um, it became the first interracial and co-educational institution in the South. So from its very founding in 1855, Berea College in Kentucky believed that black and white students should be educated together and that men and women should be educated in that same space. And then one year later, 1856, Wilberforce University was founded in Xenia, Ohio. Um, Wilberforce represents a very unique experience in the higher education experience and higher education overall um, because it represents two things. First, it was a joint venture between the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or the AME, and the Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, it was named after an 18th century abolitionist, but it was also the very first black owned and operated college in the United States. Um, and so that becomes important because it represents the first time black folks decided to invest in a structured higher education enterprise versus engaging with other individuals who were white abolitionists, for example, who might have founded some other historically black colleges and universities. And this represents one of the unique opportunities. And so we're gonna just keep moving forward. And so in 1862, President Lincoln, yes, our President Lincoln, signed the Morrill Act. Um, and 1862 represents a unique turning point for the higher education and higher education as an enterprise. Um, the Morrill Act created the land grant colleges that you and I have come to know. Um, so if you're from Illinois, you might know this place called the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. That is Illinois's land grant institution. If you're in Ohio, like I am today, the Ohio State University represents that um, development from the Land Grant Act. But while many people might know that President Lincoln signed into, act, into law the Morrill Act, creating the land grant colleges, something that they might not know is exactly what this act gave permission to happen. So in 1862, the Morrill Act gave every state and territory 30,000 acres per member of Congress to be used to establish a land grant university. And so what really happened was that approximately 17 million acres out west um, were taken from mostly indigenous people um, through violence um, and land stealing, essentially, granted to states who ultimately sold them and used the funds from that selling of land um, to create the land grant institutions we know today. And so you might be thinking, Derek, we're talking about higher education and racism. That doesn't seem right. You're correct. Um, and realistically, the part that becomes really important is that even though we talk about land grant universities um, as the ultimate opportunity um, in higher education, um, it was meant to educate the widest diversity of students. Um, it is in fact embedded on a racist decision um, by the US government to take the land of indigenous folks to allow states to create wealth um, and the creation of institutions. And so we have to wrestle with the promise and the impact of the Morrill Act with the actual means that were used to ultimately get us there. And so as someone who works for a land grant institution um, based at The Ohio State University and one who works with several of them, we have to know in our history that even in our formation, we were in fact jeopardizing the relationship across the diversity of people um, in this country. And so the Morrill Act represents a unique challenge for us in the ways in which we move forward. But I won't stop there. Let's keep going. And so I'm gonna jump forward to 1872, take a little bit back to the history of Illinois Wesleyan, when Hannah Scher graduated in, from Illinois Wesleyan as its first female alumna. Um, and so it's important to know that Illinois Wesleyan in many ways was progressive in this front. Um, they were one of the earlier institutions, if you look at time-wise, from its initial founding to its first female graduate. Um, and so that becomes important. And then if we go forward a little further, in 1880, Gus A. Hill became the first black graduate of Illinois Wesleyan University, some 30 years um, after its founding. And in those ways, Illinois Wesleyan is relevant to our larger, abbreviated but curated timeline of U.S. higher ed. Um, and so you'll see on this slide, there's also 
a note about West Point, Henry Flipper was the first person, um, black person to graduate from West Point Academy. Um, and then in 1881, Spelman College was founded. Hold that date in your mind as we progress forward. Um, now though, I'm gonna pause on 1890. That's when the second Moral Act was signed. And it wrestles a bit with the history of the 1862 law, um, but this is what the act required each state to do. Um, so the, moral, the second Moral Act required each state to show that race was not an admissions criteria or to designate a separate land grant institution for persons of color. Um, and so this was a result of the broader field and, and administrative um, directors, uh, direction of states to recognize, and the federal government to recognize that the 1862 Land Grant Act or the Moral Act was successful, um, but it did not ensure um, that states, particularly for this example, was focused on those in the South, but it, I will show you an example later that shows that it was a Northern problem as well, um, that the states in the South, those of the Confederacy, um, did not comply with the initial intent and did not actually open the institution up fully. And so we'll come back to some of the impacts of the Second Moral Act as we move forward. But let's take a trip back to Kentucky. Um, as you remember, Berea College opened almost or a bit before this, but in 1904, Kentucky passed the Day Law um, and ultimately prohibited interracial education. And so what you'll notice is that has a significant and intentional impact on places like Berea College. Um, and so they had to stop enrolling Black students. And as a result, they helped uh, establish Lincoln Institute, which is now Lincoln University, um, in the middle of the country versus Lincoln University that is found in Pennsylvania. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to call your attention to two other dates in the early 1900s. In 1908, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated was founded at Howard University. It represented the first black sorority founded at a black institution um, at Howard University. I included the date for personal reference because Rosetta is a member of AKA. Um, and I find that to be an important marker in the ways in which higher education began to change in the early 20th century. Um, additionally, in 1911, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated was founded at Indiana University. I am a proud member of Kappa. Um, I joined the fraternity at Illinois Wesleyan um, through the chapter at Illinois State University. Um, but one of the reasons I included Kappa here in this moment is because it represented a time in history in the state of Indiana where ultimately the ways in which engaging as students was shifted and shaped differently depending on your race. So if you look at the early history books of Kappa Alpha Psi, you will hear the founders in their own words talking about the fact that as a black student at IU in Bloomington, Indiana, um, the founding and birthplace of our fraternity, they had to sit outside the windows and hear the lecture from students or from their professors. So they, they were students of the university, but they were not allowed in the classrooms. And that for me is a reminder that while Indiana might have been inclusive in the education of black students, they reminded black students constantly that they were seen as second class citizens and students um, by having them not be able to engage in the classroom setting. And so we're gonna keep on moving forward. And we're gonna jump to 1938. Um, and you will see that I'm highlighting a case that was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court called Missouri X. Rail Gaines versus Canada. And ultimately what I want you to pull from this understanding is that the ruling required the state to either allow Lloyd Lionel Gaines to attend the University of Missouri School of Law or to create another school that would provide the same education for him. If you can imagine what folks were thinking in 1938, you likely know what happens. Missouri built a black law school. Um, they went out of their way to ensure that Mr. Gaines was not going to be a student at the Missouri School of Law. And unfortunately, that is sort of where the, the immediate impact of this ruling ends, um, because unfortunately, three months after the ruling, Mr. Gaines left his apartment to buy post-it stamps is what is written in history, and he was never seen again. Um, and so, that raises a question for me. Um, was it that 
folks were upset about the fact that there was a ruling against the state of Missouri um, and its law school, um, that something intentionally happened to Lloyd Gaines. I doubt as someone who was pursuing a legal education, he would suddenly disappear off the face of the earth without some um, important or unintentional thing happening to him. It was not by his own fruition, I would imagine. And so with that, I'm going to call a quick moment to 1941. Um, there was a Harvard lacrosse player named Lucen Alexis Jr. Um, and while Harvard's lacrosse team was integrated, um, he was there to play a game at the U.S. Naval Academy, but, but was not allowed to play because the U.S. Naval Academy said that black students were not allowed on the lacrosse field. Um, and so with that, I'm going to keep us moving forward. Um, and so in 1947, um, W. Allison Davis, pictured here, um, became the first black tenured faculty member at what is quote unquote considered the prestigious institutions. Um, we all know the reputation and imp impact of the University of Chicago, um, but it was not until 1947 that institutions like the University of Chicago um, actually provided a unique opportunity to show um, fac tenured faculty members that black folks too could be professors. Uh, and then quick note is that in 1950, the day law was amended. Um, it allowed colleges and universities to again educate white and black students, but it, it insisted that K-12 education was not a space for that. And so let's keep it going. In 1953, Albert Manley was named president of Spelman College. Um, and he was the first black president of Spelman um, some 72 years after its founding. And then secondly, in 1976, you'll notice a gap in years, um, the US Naval Academy it admitted its first women um, to the academy. There were a total of 81 admitted, 80 of them were white and one was black. Um, and so it's important, I think, in this moment to call out a couple things. One is that higher ed, by nature, um, does have racist implications. But that does not mean that we are not acknowledging the sexism that also occurs in this space and in the broader society. For example, the fact that U.S. Naval Academy did not have women um, as students until 1976 tells us that. But even then, when they did admit women, 81 of them in total 80 were white and one was black. And you have to start asking questions about what were the systems or structures that made that be possible. And so with that, I'm gonna keep us moving forward. And so in 1984, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in the case Grove City College versus Bell. Um, and ultimately, as someone who's worked in financial aid, this was a very important um, consideration. The holding of the case was that even though Grove City College was a private institution, much like Illinois Wesleyan, it had to abide by non or anti-discrimination laws um, since students were able to receive financial aid. To avoid complying with this ruling, Grove City College decided that it would simply stop participating in federal financial aid. Um, and that tells us something about the ways in which the legal system and places like the U.S. Department of Ed have attempted to remedy um, the, the impacts of discrimination and racism in American society, but the degrees to which in higher ed, they're not necessarily able to hold folks accountable unless they have some connection to a federal program like financial aid. Um, and then in 1990, Margaret Ro Marguerite Ross Barnett um, became the president of the University of Houston, um, making her the first black woman to lead a major university. Um, and it's important to note that Mrs. Barnett became president of the University of Houston after serving as chancellor of the University of Missouri in St. Louis, um, or UMSL as some folks are inclined to call it. Um, and then additionally in 1990, um, Barack Obama, 44th president of the United States, was elected as the first black president of the Harvard Law Review. Um, and so if you remember, Harvard was our case study of the first higher ed institution. Some 300 years later, is when they had their first black president of their law review. And then I'm gonna take a little bit more time in the 90s, um, partly because it's more recent and then also because it has had some intentional impact on the way that we currently operate in higher ed. And so 1992, there was a decision by the US Supreme Court called United States versus Fortis. 
Um, and it was specifically focused um, on public universities in the state of Mississippi. Um, and ultimately the ruling held that the eight public universities in Mississippi had not sufficiently integrated and that the state must take action under the Equal Protection Clause. It's really important to note though that the Supreme Court's, Supreme Court's ruling um, did not declare the current system in Mississippi um, as unconstitutional. Instead, it said that the, the state of Mississippi and its public universities needed to do a better job integrating the institutions. While this decision was specifically about the institutions in Mississippi, the U.S. Department of Education, in accordance with that ruling, also took immediate action against 18 other states um, looking for the need to desegregate their public higher education system. Um, and then also in 1992, and for a point of reference, it's the first time that we have Hispanic serving institutions designation um, as a federally recognized designation for institutions. It's important to note that though, historically black colleges are about the students that they were meant to serve and the ways in which they came into being. HSIs as a designation is really solely about the number or percentage of students um, being educated at a respective co college or university. Um, and then in 1994, the Improving America School Act um, allowed tribal colleges and universities to be eligible for land grant status. And it's important to note that land grant status um, of 1890 and in 1994 did not give away additional land for people to sell and invest in higher education. Instead, it simply made institutions eligible for federal funding. And so with that, I'm gonna bring us into the 2000s. And so in 2001, um, pictured to your right, right, Ruth Simmons was named president of Brown University. And in 2001, she became the first and only black president of an Ivy League institution. Um, when she retired, she commented on this, and to this day, she is still the only. Um, but it is also important to know that in 2001, um, when President Simmons was entering her second presidency, um, she's now on her third, at Brown University, there was also a shift in higher education to engage in discussions around the impact, the history, the connection of higher education institutions to slavery. Um, and so Brown University was one of the earliest um, institutions and under President Simmons' direction, Brown established the Steering Committee on Slavery and Racial Justice. Um, and so if you were to look at the history um, of universities of, and colleges around slavery, you'll note that many of our institutions benefited from slavery. So for example, in 2016, Georgetown admitted that it ultimately was allowed to save the institution financially by selling 272 enslaved individuals in 1838. Um, the slaves were sold by Jesuit priests and ultimately used the money to pay off the debts um, for the institution. Um, and then additionally, slavery was a part of the curriculum at many of our universities. And so the faculty and curriculum at Rutgers University and other early American colleges reinforced the theological and scientific racism that proved that ideological and spiritual justification for the free labor of Africans, the absolute power of slave owners, and the separation of the races. Um, and that came out of Rutgers' own investigation of its history with slavery in a 2016 report. And so now I'm gonna bring us into the last decade. Um, and so in 2014, two really important things happened um, in the state of Ohio, the place where I currently call home. The first is that Central State University received the 1890 land grant status. Um, and as I mentioned, having land grant status ensured additional support from the federal government. Um, and so the part that has been quieter um, and the history of the land grant in institutions in Ohio is that when the 1890 Land Grant University Act was signed, um, Central State asked to be recognized as a historically black land grant college or university. Um, and unfortunately, former Ohio governor and U.S. President Ruther B. Ford, Ruther Ford Hayes um, was a member of the Ohio State Board of Trustees. Um, and he used his political influence to dissuade the Ohio government from recognizing central state. Um, and instead ensured that the second, the support that came out of the second moral act was in fact directed to the Ohio State University 
rather than Central State University, although it was the 1890 institution in the state. Um, and so when 2014 finally occurred, we learned that from 1890 until 2014, Central State was pushing um, against the structures of our campuses and the higher education system to be recognized and to receive the funds that they were rightly due. Um, but because of the influence of folks at the predominantly white, the Ohio State University, um, they were not successful. And ultimately that meant that students at Central State had less resources in their institution to be successful in the spaces of agriculture, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and so we have to acknowledge that that was true. It was also interesting that when the initial push happened again in 2012, the legislators that were considering the bill went to then president of The Ohio State University, Gordon Gee, and asked if he was in favor um, of the decision. And so that is another conversation that we can have later. Um, but also in 2014, Michael V. Drake was named the 15th president of The Ohio State University, making him the first black president um, of Ohio State and making him the person who ultimately gave me my degree um, when I earned my PhD at Ohio State in 2015. And so then the last thing I want to raise for you um, is around the state of Maryland. Um, and so in 2020, as in several months before the COVID outbreak, um, Maryland created a settlement around HBCUs that awarded them over $500 million to rectify the inconsistencies in funding um, that were allocated to them through their history. Um, and so they represent the most current effort to bring parity or to, to relieve the inequities that occurred in the higher education system. And so I'm gonna stop with the history there and I wanna tell you two things. One is we don't want to make this a conversation just about all the things that went wrong in higher ed. And so this is a graduation picture from 2015 when I and three other black men received our PhDs and made some national press. Um, and I don't really talk, like talking about myself, so I'm gonna keep us moving. And then in 2016, friends of mine graduated from Indiana University um, with similar accomplishments. All eight of them earned PhDs from the School of Education um, at IU Bloomington. Um, but the part that I want you to know about this story, while the national news thought it was great to talk about and to publicize, when the story was originally pitched at Indiana University, the communications department thought it didn't matter um, because it wasn't all that unique. So what, eight black women earned PhDs? And that to me tells us some of the conversation that we need to be having around what stories are worth telling and what impact might they have um, on future generations of students. And so now I'm gonna move us forward and away from timelines to a bit of application. And I'll do this quickly so that we can have time together for conversation. Um, and so when we think about application, I think there are four or three primary areas that institutions of higher education must consider. The first is around recruitment and retention of students, faculty, and staff. Um, we often talk about the need for diverse campuses, diversity of thought, diversity of race and gender um, and sexuality. And that is fine and well, recruitment is great. Um, but if we can't retain students till graduation, or faculty and staff year over year, we're, we're investing a lot of upfront resources that ultimately don't prove to benefit our institutions. And so we have to be cognizantly and intentionally engaged in conversations around recruitment and retention regularly, continually, ongoingly. Second is around this idea of chief diversity, equity, inclusion, or whatever the key word is in this season, um, officers and US, US colleges and universities. And the thing that I want to say to us about CDOs, they are great when supported. But what I don't want us to do is to say, we have a race problem. It's time to get a black chief diversity officer. That doesn't help us move the institution forward. Before you go to hire a CDO, we have to ask a more important question. Is our institution in its current form structured in a way that will ensure that a chief diversity, equity, or an inclusion officer will be successful in moving the institution forward? And if the answer is, I don't know, or probably not, pause on the hiring of a chief diversity officer and do some of the groundwork that's necessary. And then lastly, let's talk about merit aid. I have had the privilege of learning about financial aid 
and working in the financial aid space because of Illinois Wesleyan University and specifically Scott Sebring, um, who gave me the opportunity to engage in meaningful conversations um, around what Illinois Wesleyan and other institutions thought about student aid. And there's generally two camps of aid, merit aid um, and then need-based aid. And one of the things that I want us to wrestle with, no one is saying get rid of merit aid, but we are saying are we meeting the needs of the students that we invite into our campus through the use of need-based aid? Um, and if the answer is no, it might require us to shift some of that aid toward need-based aid so that the students who can't afford to be at Wesleyan or institutions like Wesleyan are able to be supported financially in ways that allow them not to be stressed um, about paying their tuition or living as students. Um, the second part is that I know that folks often say that merit aid is used to attract the most competitive students. That's true, but I have tons of examples of where merit aid was decreased and the profile of student demographics did not change um, and in some ways were enhanced. And so we can have conversations around how that might be done. And then lastly, higher ed certainly has work to do, um, but we as a society need to be thinking in this way as well. And so for uh, personally, I would ask you, I would ask myself, I would ask that leaders of higher education institutions and the leaders of broader society, what is it that you will do personally with the knowledge that you've gained given the life, lived experience you've had? How is it that you will be transformed or the work that you are doing will be made better um, from what you know? And then secondly, we have to be willing to take real looks at what society is saying to us. And so here's what I'm going to say to you. It is great to know how many students of a particular group we have or how many people live in this particular state. But when we start to talk about equity and justice, we have to ask questions about what is it per capita? So what I'm saying to you is, how is it that people based on various demographic characteristics, specifically in this case, race, um, how is it that they fare in our society? Is it that per capita, black people are more or less likely to be successful? If so, we have to ask the question, why is that? And what is it that we can do differently um, to engage in meaningful dialogue that will move us forward to be more just and more equitable? Um, and that is where I will stop and turn it back over to Rosetta so that we can engage in questions. Derek, thank you so much for sharing such a wealth of information with us today. I really uh, appreciate your perspective and that historical knowledge. It was really very informative. Um, as we start the Q&A session, I'd like to ask everyone to be sure to focus your que questions on the topic Derek presented or specifically to um, Dr. Tillman Kelly's expertise. If you have specific questions about um, Illinois Wesleyan, I invite you to join us tomorrow as we will have faculty and staff members um, available or staff members rather um, available tomorrow that could possibly answer those questions for you. Um, so let me just go through the Q&A really quickly and see what we have here. It's really more comments. Uh, while this information is amazing, I'm proud of you for putting this together and being a disruptor. I'm not sure <laughs> what that part means, but that was uh, Catherine Braish. I hope I said that right, 2012. Um, Dave Darling, a... Uh, Alumni Association board member says, Derek has provided a very educational, informative, and thought-provoking webinar. I hope a large percentage of IWU Titans have the opportunity to view this webinar. Thank you, Derek, proud to be your friend, Dave Darling. And then he later said, I want to correct that, and I should actually state that all IWU Titans did view this important webinar. Um, Phyllis McCluskey says, hi, Derek, so great to see you and to have followed you your educational and career journey so far. If people on the webinar want more information about the connection between higher education and slavery, Wilder's 2013 book, Ebony and Ivy, is informative and eye-opening. Phyllis McCluskey Titus from Illinois State University. Thank and you Rosetta. for that information. And I will say, Phyllis, I'm in 100% agreement. And it's even linked um, on the back end of this presentation and resources because it is the, 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 the cornerstone of this conversation nationally. Um, and if you're not familiar with it and the way that it engages, we have to be intentional about reconciling that America was a country that enslaved people and therefore it's 
showed in the buildings that were built on college and university campuses, and it continues to shape the way that we will engage collectively. Um, and so I think we have to be honest. And so I think that in fact is a very good read. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, for sharing that. Um, Hannah Masani with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion says, what groundwork does DTK feel is necessary at IWU or in general to prepare us for a chief diversity officer? Yeah, and so I think I will stay away from the institution specifically, um, but some things that are necessary. First is that you have disaggregated data that lets you know what your populations of interest are experiencing, right? You need to know if certain demographics of students, whether that's black women, right, because it's, it's always an intersection of identities, are experiencing specifically unique or different under uh, experiences at the institution. But then also you have to start thinking about what is the organizational capacity for this work? Um, chief diversity officers often come in with a decent pay um, and no structure to support their work. That's unfair to them. And it's unfair to believe that one person can change the legacy, the history, the culture of an institution by having conversations, engaging in meaningful trainings and completely changing the direction of the institution. That's not fair. Um, and ultimately we have to be sure that the groundwork is prepared, that a structure will be in support of the work. Great. Yolanda, and I am not a, on social media, so I'm not sure what this symbol means. Derek, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> it's a heart. Oh, okay. Love me base eight. <laughs> Show my age again. Where would one find information like this, timelines, dates specifically? And so around, if Yolanda's talking about need based aid, that's really something that financial aid would be able to share for, with you. So how much is the financial aid budget overall? How much of that is directed toward need based aid versus um, merit aid? And then that would be a conversation to happen. The deadlines and that sort of thing will vary by institution. Um, but it is also important that the um, point to know is that institutions are asked to report on this to the, to the federal government. So they know um, this information, how they share it is a whole different conversation. Okay, Professor Carolyn A. Doe for Hispanic Studies says, thank you so much for this talk. So informative. I have a question about financial aid. Are there standard divisions between merit-based and need-based giving across, giving across institutions? For example, is it 50-50 or another type of division or does it really vary from school to school? So you can find some um, similar patterns in um, institution type, if that's the best way to put it. So for example, by and large community colleges, almost 100% of their budget would be need-based because of the kinds of work that they do and the kinds of students they serve. Um, though when you start talking about the more reputable national and, or international organizations, you tend to see more than a 50% slant toward merit aid because it's about competing for the best, um, the brightest students, which really mean those who have really high school, high GPAs and standardized test scores. Um, and that is a different conversation. And so it can vary institution to institution. What you're seeing though nationally is that people are starting to acknowledge the percent that is merit aid and starting to bring that down to raise the need-based aid. And so it's a shifting target at this moment. Okay. Ellie Jones. Hi, Ellie. She's a former president of the Alumni Association Board of Directors. She says, Derek, really good presentation. So great to see you. Um, and you mentioned the Maryland HBCU sell settlement of over $500 million. Have any other states rectified the funding that is still owed? I am hoping so. There have been other states. Um, Maryland, I, I should be very clear, the settlement was pr approved before COVID before budgets for states are dramatically impacted. So we are not sure that Maryland will pay out the 500 million in the near future. And so we have to deal with that. But yes, there have been other states. Um, there has been some of that work in Mississippi. There's been some of that work in Alabama. Um, and one of the states, I'm remiss on the actual state, um, gave a settlement at the time around $500 million. And today it's worth 750 million or so. But so people are starting, but they're not, we're not really engaged in that meaningfully yet. 
Okay, Dirk Barons, 87, another Alumni Association board member. Thank you all for representing and supporting your colleague here today. Um, as to the per capita comment, especially around societal institutional racism, what other resources do you find valuable to help educate ourselves? So I think one of the easiest is going to spaces of the census, um, right? They will tell you the most clear per capita understanding of the life outcomes, um, and we can send some links around the longitudinal surveys that happen that look at life outcomes by race, gender, that sort of thing, and based in time, and then how that shows up across different portions of the country, different states, and different cities. Okay. Brandon Common um, from the Dean of Students um, Office asks, Derek, what are your thoughts on movements across the country by students to remove monuments on college campuses that are named after slave owners? Hmm. Brandon, really? <laughs> That's what you're going to do, Dr. Common? Um, and so I think the, the question becomes not what we should do, but who we need to listen to to, to decide what the next step is. Um, and what I mean, different people have different opinions on how that should be honored, removed, historicized, um, right? So I would say simple destruction of them probably is not our wisest um, decision. Should they stay in prominent places on campus? Listen to the faculty, staff, and students, particularly of the minoritized populations um, who have expressed harm. What would they like to see fit? And then the other part is, for many of them, if you are moving them, we need to move them to spaces like museums so that they remain educationally connected to the US and institutional history. Um, because if we don't, we can pretend that this never happened. Um, and that would be an injustice in itself. Okay, Zach, class of Zach Birch, class of 2009. This has been an excellent presentation. I think this gives a huge context to the racism of the society and how higher education prop propagates it. Love this presentation. Very nicely done, Derek. Um, I'm just trying to find more questions. Beth Robb says, so should colleges, universities initiate these discussions during orientation for freshmen? Should these discussions be required for students throughout their college years? And lastly, is this happening already? It seems one-off presentations are just making, are marking the box. And that's uh, Elizabeth Robb, 1978. And Elizabeth, your last point, absolutely. One-off presentations are just marking the box. And I think the Colleges are doing them to differing degrees. I know earlier in my alumni hood from Illinois Wesleyan, I just made that word up, sorry, was that? Um, I did. But I remember when Kira Hudson Banks um, and another faculty member in psychology started a secondary um, pre-enrollment program that had white students investigate or interrogate racism and societal ills. So we know it's happening at colleges and universities. Megan Burke is the other faculty member. Sorry, Megan. Um, and so we know it's happening, but it needs to be a continual part. And I think the part that we need to really acknowledge is that when we talk about history, if issues of race and racism, sex and sexism, um, homophobia aren't raised and contextualized in the normal understanding of history, it makes it sound like it's a one-off thing that's about a particular group of people. But realistically, Black history is American history. LGBTQ plus history is American history. And so we have to recognize that it's been a part of the history. It's a part of today. And it has to be considered, held, and wrestled with to move us forward. And I would argue that while it's important for students to engage in the conversation, it's equally as important for faculty, staff, and administrators. Um, because we can't rely on a handful of folks to be responsible for this education for all people. Right. So I'm going to um, close with two questions and, and, and say that you can join us. If I don't ask your question, uh, you can join us tomorrow for a, a continual discussion. But um, the first is from Brianna Kratz, 2012. How does the history of multicultural resource centers presence on campuses factor into the larger history of race and higher education? And so what I'll say is that there is a vast array of literature by Lori Patton Davis, um, who is now a faculty member at Ohio State University, but was at Indiana and Denver, uh, Colorado, Denver um, in the past. And what we know about multicultural centers is that they are often safe spaces 
not safe in the sense of like we don't have meaningful conversation and discussion, but they provide opportunities for those who are minoritized or marginalized to escape from the white norming um, of many of our institutions. And so they deserve a space on campus um, and they help re to both educate black students, for example, or students of color and the broader population around what it means to be in a multicultural or multiracial society. And so I think that becomes important, but I will certainly connect and share information from Lori Patton Davis's work. I actually went to SIUE with Lori Patton Davis. She's doing some great work. Um, last question for today, and that comes from Brian Payne, uh, 2001. Attracting diverse applicants to higher education is important as it is to businesses. What advice might you have in encouraging more diverse applicants in business with your knowledge in higher education? So I think <laughs> that one's tough though, Brian. Um, I think part of that is knowing um, the truth about your organization. So who are you today and who, you, who do you desire to be? Because I think when people are interested in being one of few on a campus, it's because they know what the institution is and they know who the institution desires to be and how they are scaffolding the work of the institution to get there. Um, if you don't do that work, I think it's when you get people in the door, they learn that you are different than you presented, and then they quietly or loudly and quickly flee. Um, and so I think for enterprise or business as well as higher ed, you have to do that similar approach. Be transparent in who you are, acknowledge where you are currently located and where you desire to go and how inviting diverse folks into that landscape or into that organization helps you get there without tokenizing them um, or further marginalizing them or expecting them to do all the work um, of diversity, inclusion, or equity. Right. Derek, again, thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your experience, and obviously your time with our audience today. I, I truly appreciate you, and I think you can tell from the comments others do as well. Um, to all of our guests in attendance, I hope you will join us tomorrow for a follow-up conversation with Derek. And as I said, staff members from the Dean of Students Office, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, um, who will be available to answer additional questions. The webinar titled Titan Community Conversations, Dialogue and Discussion on How We Got Here, Racism in Higher Education will start tomorrow at noon. This is an opportunity for the community to continue listening and sharing experiences for greater understanding. We will allow um, individuals to actually speak and have their voices heard during this discussion. I will close with this. Last night I watched Nightline um, and the coverage of George Floyd's funeral. A young lady made a very profound statement that I will paraphrase. She said, the rearview mirror is very small, but the windshield is much larger to see where you're going. What I took from that is we have to use the rearview mirror to see, know, and understand where we've been, but the windshield provides a greater and much broader view to see, know, and understand where we are going. Let's be sure we understand where we've been to get to the progress that is in front of us. Thanks again to all of you who joined us and for your questions and comments. We really appreciate your support of this episode of the Titan Talks webinar series. You'll be receiving an email with a survey later today. I hope you will complete it because we really would appreciate your feedback. Have a great day, everyone.